Hey, everybody, good men and women out there throughout the world and even in Canada. Welcome <laughs> to the U.S. Grace Force podcast. There's a reason for that. I'm Doug Barry along with Father Richard Heilman and our guest tonight, Dennis Gerard. Dennis is from Canada. 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 Yeah, so welcome, everybody. We appreciate you being Old here. We've got to start Canada. everything. <laughs> We're going to start everything with the, the Canadian National I'm sorry, we're going to start everything with a prayer. Okay. I'll turn that over to you, Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I was so tempted to do that in a French accent. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good <laughs> French Canada, awesome Thank you Father Hey everybody out there, I want to thank everybody who supports this work We are so thrilled that you do Your your prayers are amazing And the numbers are growing of the U.S. Grace Force We're 78,000 Phenomenal, amazing people who are on board With everything that the Grace Force stands for Engaging in the spiritual battle Being ready, body, mind, soul Ready for whatever God allows to come our way Whatever the world, whatever the enemy throws at us That we're prepared So thank you all for that And thank everybody who supports us financially Through the Patreon program If you would like to do that And you cannot imagine how helpful it is Especially right now With everything happening and unfolding like it is in the world Click the link in the description below And you can go on out Take a look at it Pray about it And consider becoming a patron and help us through this Patreon program, continue to do this work. We're trying to reach as many souls, as many lives as possible. So we thank you all for that. And don't forget to check out U.S. Grace Force official gear page, great t-shirts, great hoodies, sweatshirts, the whole nine yards, sends great messages throughout the world, and again, continues to support the work that we're doing with the Grace Force. And please share this information with other people about signing up for the U.S. Grace Force. Go to usgraceforce.com. Again, information's in the description below. And join the ranks. We've got to grow these ranks. We're looking for 100,000, 200,000, half a million, a million. God-fearing, God-loving, rosary-praying, sacrament-receiving, scripture-reading Catholics out there. Christians of all denominations can join if you like. But join the U.S. Grace Force. Let's grow this, these ranks of spiritual warriors because we're in the thick of a battle. And our guest tonight, Dennis Gerard, we're going to be talking about this. And Dennis, I know you are, you are deeply entrenched in the battle. You've got an amazing setup there right now with the image of our Lord and the statue of Our Lady and St. Michael. I got this beautiful statue of Our Lady of Fatima and the flag here. I got one. Yeah, and Father's got a great one, too. Oh, and we're going to do a podcast, we have to, Father, on the mir miraculous statue behind Father. I know. It's not a joke, folks, so stay tuned in the near future. We hope we are going to do a podcast. I'd love to, Father, if you're open to this, Yeah, um, on this amazing, miraculous statue and many other images of Our Lady around the world that have been miraculously reminding us of the seriousness of Our Lady's urgent call. And I know, Dennis, that's a big part of why you, you're involved in this movie you've done and the whole confraternity of the, of the Rosary. So could you speak a little bit about, again, the title, Mary's Blueprint, A Call to Confraternity? Give us a brief background about yourself and why we should be listening to you, my friend, and why you're so much in love with Our Lady and the need for us to take seriously this call from Our, Our Lady right now. Sure. Well, two, two things to start with. First of all, Doug, thank you for all you do in just promoting Our Lady's apparitions. You're you know, well-researched, and that's awesome. You know, We really need to get, obviously, her stories out there. And it's a pleasure to be with, of course, Father Rick, who is the spiritual advisor of SEMA. SEMA is not FEMA. SEMA is the <laughs> Coalition of Eucharistic and Marian Apostolates, just an awesome. amazing group of apostolates. And uh, we're blessed to have Father Rick with us as his spiritual advisor. And the Coalition of Apostles has been going on for a couple of years for now, uh, now. And really, the call to confraternity is something that we're all uh, getting involved with. So just a little bit of background on my wife and I. Angelina and I are the directors of the Marian Devotional Movement here in Canada. And hence the statue, Our Lady of the Cape from Trois de Viard and who our movie that we're making called The Bridge of Roses is about. The Marian devotional movement came into existence in the hundredth year of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. And that was on the Feast of the Queenship of Mary. And one of the apparitions that we really like is the one at Lourdes, of course, with St. Bernadette. And why do we like that apparition? Because of what Our Lady asked St. Bernadette to do. She just said, just go dig in the mud. 
you know, she goes and digs in the mud. And what do you know? Now we've got, well, pre-COVID, you know, millions of people going and having, of course, Eucharistic procession. So we really believe in just doing that next thing that God has called us to do. In many respects, we're kind of the least and the last that you would expect for this to happen because I did have a previous stint as a Protestant pastor. At one point, I put a white cross in front of a grotto on the... Uh, Christian retreat we were running. Angelina was a uh, Protestant as well. I was actually, I, I came as a revert back to the Catholic Church when we discovered that, uh, you know, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So uh, we, we had a prayer in our prayer closet that we said, we don't want to miss out on anything, Lord, that you have for your children. And that led to the Eucharist. Then it led to Marian consecration. And then uh, a number of years ago, somebody handed Angelina an 18-inch statue of Our Lady of the Cape. We had no idea really about Our Lady of the Cape at that time, but that led us on this journey and finding about this story, which is absolutely remarkable. We call it the greatest story never told. And the reason we call it that is because in 1867, if you can imagine, there was a diocesan priest. His name was Father Luc de Sele. He was in a dead and dying parish. He couldn't even get one soul on the Feast of the Ascension to come into confession, come and have confession with him. So he goes to pour his heart out uh, where our lady statue is. And what does he find? A pig, a pig chewing on a rosary. Mm -hmm. And really, that's the way the world is today, isn't it? It's like a pig chewing on a rosary. Mm -hmm. And what does he do? He gets to his knees and he decides to renew enrollment in the confraternity of the most holy rosary, something that had been established at Cap de la Madeleine in 1694. And the confraternity is really how the rosary developed. Of course, both of you know that as we're going to be celebrating the 450th anniversary of the confraternity on the feast of our Holy Rose of the Holy Rosary, October 7th. And of course, it was Pope Pius, Pope St. Pius V, that reached out to the confraternity in Rome, as well as the Holy League, to pray. And of course, you know what happened in terms of the mm -hmm. battle. So I'll turn it over to you and then and happy to take it from there as we go on. Yeah, this is a big year, isn't it? It's the 450th anniversary right. of the Battle of Lepanto. And I've been saying, too, that, uh, you know, it's kind of a prefigurement because what's going on right now it went on then, and that's the Turks saw a Christianity that was weak and divided mm -hmm. and said, okay, this is our time. And uh, as the story's told, they were coming in to deal the last blow. Well, my goodness, that seems like what's going on right now. We're weak and divided. And, uh, and it, th these, these um, uh, forces, uh, tyrannical forces, uh, and I call it radical secularism. People can put on kind of handle they want on it, but but these forces that are opposed to the Holy Spirit, are opposed to God, the will of God, are coming in and feel like they they're emboldened uh, that that it's their time. And so we're to sit down and shut up. We're getting censored. We're getting persecuted. Uh, uh, I, I've been in the local secular paper uh, three times in the last uh, fifteen days. Uh, because uh, how dare I be against abortion? You know, it's one of the lines they throw out to uh, to try to to uh, gin up something to to crush me. You know, but you know, I'm not. It's not about me. But I, I, it's happening everywhere. It's happening to everybody. And so I I do agree with you, Dennis, and I agree with everybody around you that that says that uh, this is this is a time like it was at the Battle of Lepanto, where we got to pick up our rosaries. We got to unite. And with the confraternity of the rosary, uh, we've, we've got to uh, sta stand our ground and uh, call on Our Lady to crush the head of the serpent, right? Amen. And it's, it's really God's providence that this recording we're doing today is going to be aired, of course, September 8th, which yes. is Our Lady's birthday. birthday. And it's also the day in 1893, September 8th, when Pope Leo XIII, who of course is known uh, in terms of writing a number, he's known as the Rosary Pope, he wrote a number of encyclicals on the Rosary. I'm just going to read one little section from September 8th, 
1893. And tell me if this sounds a little bit like today. There are three influences which appear to us to have the chief place in effecting this downgrade movement of society. These are first, the distaste for a simple and laborious life. And we're recording this on Labor Day, interestingly enough. Secondly, repugnance to suffering of any kind. Mm. Thirdly, the forgetfulness of the future life. And mm -hmm. here's what he does in this incredible wow. encyclical called Letitia Sancte. So published, as I said, September 8th, 1893. And what he does is he begins to expand on how the joyful mysteries combat this notion that domestic life is not something to be really elevated. Mm. He, he talks about how obviously the sorrowful mystery is all about Christ's suffering, obviously. Mm. We're to engage. We're, we're not to shy away from the suffering that comes mm -hmm. to us. And number three, of course, the forgetfulness of eternal life. Well, that's the glorious mysteries. Right. So he unfolds this. And by the way, this is the, the 50th year of his, um, I think it's his priesthood at the time. But in any event, he goes through these three, um, three alliterations of how the, the, the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries answer the ills of society then, which are the same ills in society today. But many of the commentaries on this encyclical, stop there. But there's a couple more paragraphs. And the next two paragraphs are very consequential. And they really are why we are here today, the three of us. And that is, he goes on to talk about the call to confraternity, that where confraternities do not exist, they need to be established. Mm. Because he understands the efficacy, the ecclesial nature of people working and praying together. Right. He is the Pope that ends up writing the Constitution on the confraternity of the Most Holy Rosary. Mm -hmm. So this is a groundbreaking encyclical. And I'll tell you why the timing is now and why probably not beforehand. Because in 2018, Pope Francis brought all of the shrines of Our Lady under the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but all of Mary, Mary's shrines, they used to be, you know, of a devotional nature. Now they are under the Pontifical Council for the promotion of the New Evangelization. Why? Because that's where we encounter God. Mm -hmm. So as we are praying our rosaries, as people are flocking to shrines as they are and as they will, this is where conversion takes place. Mm -hmm. So I know a favorite word of yours is convergence. We have the perfect convergence of many elements taking place, and it is actually a perfect moment for the confraternity to be renewed. And that's what Mary's blueprint is about. It's not our blueprint. This is her blueprint. Yeah, and so if I can chime in real quick here, um, the three points that you mentioned that Pope Leo XIII wrote about, people yeah. who don't want a simple, laborious life, they don't want to have to work hard, and they don't want anything to just simple, raise your kids, you know, I heard it put one time, I think it was Kimberly Hahn, Scott Hahn's wife, who said, I'm saving the world one diaper at a time. Yeah. You know, just the idea that raising your family, caring for your family, being a good man, a good wife, good husband, good wife, and so forth. People don't want that. They want the flash and the flare, which do you think that a lot of that comes from, because I do, I think it comes from the fact that our so-called influencers, social media influencers out there from YouTube to Instagram, they paint this picture that life is nothing but travel and excitement. And, and I'm always smiling and I'm always happy. And I look at my, look at my lunch. I got to take a picture of my lunch and post it on Instagram. <laughs> I mean, this, this, this just kind of, this just flies in the face of the lives of the saints or, or just the average simple person who says, look, food is nourishment. Let's enjoy it. Sure. But do we got to take a picture of it and post it so everybody can give us likes or dislikes? That just seems extreme. So first of all, do you think that part of the reason we have this repugnance or this, this avoidance of a simple life that involves work, involves effort, 
Do you think that that's because we've, do you see this as a plan of the enemy? Do you see this as, you know, the, the media that's out there? That's, what is it that's indoctrinating us and our young people at such a young age to want to avoid this? Win the lottery, retire early, sail around on a yacht or drive around in an RV, and that's their goal in life. But working hard, you know, praying hard, simple life just doesn't seem to cut it for most. Why do you think that is in general, Dennis? Well, I can tell you from personal experience why it is, because my conversion didn't take place till 33. And I mean, I toured in a rock band. It was all, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what we were taught. And if you haven't had a conversion experience, then that's what you know. You, I mean, you think it's all about you. It's all about gaining your glory, being, you know, having it all, as we say. And of course, great saints like St. Saint Augustine knew that all too well. So it comes down to conversion. <laughs> All of this comes down to conversion. And Jesus is the king of leverage, I like to call him. And who does he leverage? He leverages the media tricks of all grace. One apparition, and you can see millions of people converted. And I can tell you, when I, when I came to faith in Christ at 33, it was actually through Protestant circles. So I had what you call that quote-unquote Born again experience. I didn't know that Catholics had like this born again experience. Then I end up reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And here I am in section 1431, where it says interior repentance is a radical reorientation of our whole life, a return, a conversion to God with all of our heart, an end to sin, a turning away from evil with repugnance towards the evil action we have committed. Yeah, so like, this, I, I, I got to real quick. I just got to intervene here because uh, you know you, you, your your energy and your enthusiasm is is in, is you know very you know contagious. What was the first thing that you remember that actually woke you up to get out of the the life of the rock and roll and so forth and, and all that went with it? And actually start to turn towards God. What was like, was there something that happened? <laughs> yeah, it was a desert storm pilot. And a desert storm pilot told me that the Bible was the word of God. And if I didn't believe that, then there was no point in reading it. And then I understood through prophecy that it'd be impossible for this not to be the word of God. So if it's the word of God, oh my goodness, I'm reading it suddenly with a different lens. Mm -hmm. And then I get to Jesus's lines where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. And I knew at that moment I needed to make that decision. And when I made that decision, I had my conversion experience and I understood what this catechism was saying. Now, what's really interesting about conversion is it, it's first the work of God's grace. It isn't something that I procured. God's supernatural grace worked on my heart, on my hardened heart. That's one of Father's favorite things right there, by the way. You know, right. supernatural grace, just that supernatural right. power of God. And the Father's always talking about how we've lost touch with that. Right. Yeah. So why am I so excited about Our Lady and her being the mediatrix of grace? Because she is the means of that supernatural grace. Yep. So the call to confraternity is not complicated. It's about unleashing as much grace as possible right. on this planet. That's because right. we ain't getting anywhere. And really, quite frankly, all that matters is where people are going at their last breath. I can tell you, I had the awesome experience of my dad's last breath. He was converted at 78 years old, wow. guys. 78. And it was after we began renewing the confraternity. We know it was a result of the confraternity. Mm -hmm. And at his last breath, I experienced where the scripture says the soul left the body and his body recoiled. And it was so obvious that he was gone and that his body was here and that all that matters to me is conversion. Where are you going at the last breath? That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. And what is the best way for conversion? Through the media tricks of grace. She's right. the way. We know that at Fatima, Jesus was very clear, yeah. you know, increased devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You know, he knows what he's doing because what is going to happen? Grace is going to get unleashed. 
And the rosary is the most powerful means of doing that. And when that happens, people are going to be converted. That's what's going to get things turned around. And quite frankly, if you're a student of history, I mean, it doesn't matter which century you're in. Our lady's going to come and do things. What I find absolutely remarkable, and I love the apparition of St. Catherine Laboree, this is the only apparition where Our Lady allowed someone to come and sit and kneel and be on her lap for two hours. The chair is still there at Rue de Bac. And Our Lady poured out to St. Catherine Laboree everything that was going to take place. She was weeping at times. And even when she was weeping at times, it's not like she said, oh, Maybe I better not release the miraculous medal in the 1800s because, wow, there's going to be all these revolutions. In 1948, 50 revolutions through Europe, blood in the streets. I mean, that's pretty grim stuff. Did she say, oh, no, let's wait for a better time to release the miraculous medal? No, she released it then. Why? Because that's when there was going to be all these conversions. Look at Radisbone. His conversion is phenomenal. So quite frankly... I believe the call to confraternity is our century's miraculous medal. Yeah. And that's what the story of Our Lady of the Cape is all about. And all of us are invited to be written into this story. This isn't about a story that's happened and we can't participate. And we're just reading and going, wow, wasn't that cool what happened? No, 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 no. We are all invited into this story. We are written into the story in this day. We can be praying our rosaries. We can be promoting enrollment in the confraternity. And that's what's going to unleash grace. And I've got to tell you, just so that you can understand that this is Mary's blueprint and no manufacturer of man, myself, or anybody else. Here's what, hey, here's how this all came about. In December, in December, just this past December, we were, uh, we were, we were told about the, uh, the uh, promoter general of the confraternity of the Most Holy Rosary. And probably we need a little bit of historical background. It's important that you know that the confraternity is ministered through the Dominican order. It's the Dominicans that are entrusted with establishing it. So my wife Angelina and I were given permission to begin renewing the confraternity up at Cap de la Madeleine. And we started doing that in 2017. And thousands of people started enrolling all over the world, which blew us away. One story in particular, because here we are in Canada, and I, and I was saying to, to Mother Mary one morning, Mother Mary, I wonder if somebody from Australia is ever going to enroll in the confraternity. 24 hours later, I had an enrollment from Sydney, Australia. So she was telling us that this was for the world. So in December, getting back to the promoter general of the rosary, we reached out to the promoter general. And that same day, a rosary priest from Croatia on the other side of the world had emailed Father Lawrence Liu telling him to get in touch with us. And our call was all about, hey, look at what Mary is doing through this one little shrine in Canada. Can you imagine if we duplicate this through all her Marian shrines or great Marian shrines? We could really leverage a lot of rosaries and get a lot of people enrolled in the confraternity. And that is Mary's blueprint. That's what she wants. And it's the perfect opportunity to all work together to do that. You know, I, I was thinking about <clears throat> that amazing letter, excuse me. <clears throat> by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and uh, the joyful mysteries that, that talked about the simplicity of life, and uh, what, I want to say dignity of labor, but uh, but uh, I was thinking right away of my own upbringing, and I feel blessed I, now. Thirty three years of priest, and hearing a lot of people's stories about their own family lives, I feel a um, million times blessed because so many people didn't have what what I fortunately did. But what did I have? I had a mom that woke up early in the morning and went to mass while we were sleeping every day with her mom. Uh, they were like the two Marys. And uh, anytime I was with mom at mass, uh, you'd see her kneeling with her rosary wrapped around her hands. She had a deep, deep devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, and the mass that, that, that she went to was a 6 a.m. mass. Um, there, there, was later, there was a later mass, like at 8.30 or something like that. 
in the parish. Uh, <clears throat> at first, the six o'clock mass had a, maybe a dozen people going, but after time, uh, my mom was the only one there. And God bless the pastor who kept the mass going for my mom. They have jokingly called it the June mass. That was my mom's name, June. Um, but, you know, I, I look at my parents and, and what did they have? They had a deep faith that gave them that peace. And that's what I'm hearing when I, when I, when I hear about simplicity of life and dignity of work and things like that. Because, see, when you're disconnected from God, you're, you're, you're disconnected from the divine life. You have no life in you. You're like a walking spiritual zombie. And so I'm listening to you talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, I need sex. And it's like, you know, clear, boom, you know, trying to get the heart to beat again, you know, try to get life back in. And, okay, drugs, boom, you know. Um, it, it, you know what I'm saying there? You're trying to get the heart that stopped to start again. You're, in other words, you're looking for every thrill you can possibly find to jolt yourself into um, a, a sense of life in, in yourself when you're disconnected from the divine life. But when you're connected to the divine life, then the simple things are awesome. You know, I, I, you know, I can remember holidays. You know, I mean, they were just awesome. We worked. Um, um, when I was like a, a toddler almost, my dad parked us out on the ninth hole at uh, Odana Golf Course with uh, six cases of, of soda. And we sold soda to golfers passing by. Uh, I, I cut, I mowed everybody's lawn. I, I delivered papers. Uh, my dad started a business. We started, we, we were working in, in, in a warehouse. It, probably at that time, they didn't enforce the uh, the laws uh, for, for working too young, but we, it was a family business. We thought we were in heaven. And everything that we did as a family, we thought we were in heaven. And it was just the simplest stuff. And we, so we didn't need that jolt. And I can remember too, getting into my college years, like a lot of college people, you know, the, the culture just yanks you out of the arms of God and puts set you in the world. And then all of a sudden, what are you doing? You're running around to get that next thrill, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever you can find. And see, that's where the world is right now. And if they would only understand that once, once they let themselves come into the arms of God, into the arms of Our Lady, that, that peace that's beyond all understanding comes over them and all of a sudden, a blade of grass is amazing. <laughs> you know, uh, it, 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 simple things, in other words. Unless you got a really big lawn and you got a lot to mow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, I mowed a million lawns in my <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I right, question well, we got for Sodium that does it for me. But, anyways, <laughs> but, but, uh, but you see what I'm saying there? Yeah. And so, how important this is. Uh, and, and, and so, Dennis, you're talking about this confraternity. You know, we've been doing the U United States Grace Force and been praying the rosary a lot together. It's sort of like that. But this has the kind of, this has the ecclesiastical authority over it. It was established by popes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and bolstered by popes. Um, and this is a way for us to, it, I believe, in a supernatural way, to come together as a body of Christ, as children of God, as sons and daughters of our Blessed Mother, okay, uh, to come together and and to pray not only for the peace for ourselves, but for our loved ones. How many how many us, of us right now are are seeing so many around us? I mean, the stories I'm hearing, these wonderfully devout families, and the the kid goes to the concentration camp. I mean, college. And, and uh, you know, it, it, the indoctrination camp, I, uh, and, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden the kids pulled out of the arms of Christ and now is, you know, dead inside and trying to, trying to, again, jolt life back into himself or herself in any way they can find. And, and, and these parents, and me, <clears throat> everyone is looking at this and just... We're so sad for them when we know, come into our Lord's arms, come into our Lady's arms, and watch that peace, that amazing peace. You know, he'll he'll take you in verdant pastures beside restful waters. It says, right? That's what that means. It's it's like being out in in, in this peaceful um, nature scene, and 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 you're just you're just nothing else matters that you're just there and you're with God and you're at peace. Is that, is that, that kind of what you're getting there from that, 
what, what Pope Leo the Thirteenth was talking about with that first. Yes, um, and yes, and you've also hit on something that's really important and really key, and it's something that Angelina made sure we asked uh, the Promoter General, and that is: at what age can people enroll in the confraternity? And it's basically communion age. Can nice. you imagine if the confraternity was part of communion prep and and that kind of thing? Because the stories of Our Lady. Are, are captivating. They're wonderful stories. So, you know, we need to be teaching our children that, but we also need to be teaching them the rosary, having them enroll in the confraternity. We have many, many enrollees that are children now. So that's something that we need to be very intentional about. So family, very important. I'm glad you brought up your uh, beautiful Catholic heritage. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it and it makes a difference. It just made me think of that, and 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 it just uses an example of, you know, we don't have to be racing around to try to find thrills, that just the simplest mm -hmm. things can just be amazing when you're in that when they're you know, when you're in the presence of God when you're in the peace of our Lord when you're in the, Our Lady's arms. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to chime in here on something. Um, you know, the timing of Our Lady in Fatima and, and, you know, Father, you and I have talked about this. We brought this up in past podcasts and it's one of those messages I think you could hear every day. You know, people struggle to pray the rosary. We know this. I mean, I've struggled. My wife and I started praying the rosary daily quite a while ago. And at one point I actually apologized to my children who are all now moved out. Um, and uh, I apologized to them one day years ago. And I said, I talk about Our Lady and apparitions and the rosary all over the country. And I've been doing it for many years. At that point, it had been, I don't know, 20, 25 years, whatever it had been. It's 31 years now. And I said, but I have not been as vigilant or as faithful in praying the daily rosary with you all. And that's going to change. And so we, as a family, we've always encouraged it. Now my kids have moved out and, you know, they have, you know, as, as we all know, our parents, our kids have to own their faith. It's, it's up to them once they move out. But my wife and I still pray the rosary. Now we don't miss a day. I mean, and, and that's not a pat on the back or anything. And we don't feel good all the time, meaning, oh, I'm so excited. I'm lofty. I've been floating around the house praying the rosary. You know, it's so wonderful. I hear, oh, all the time when I'm praying. No, most of the time I hear, you know, you know, kind of like, um, I feel like, you know, my, I always say I'm going to write a book one day that, you know, um, when I pray, I hear crickets, you know, because, you know, you kind of feel that dryness, you know, that, you know, we hear the saints talk about, you know, and St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul, Senses, the Desert, all this sort of thing. When I pray the rosary, I don't do it because it feels great. I do it because I know she has asked for it and she has made it abundantly clear. And she doesn't do this on her own. As you said earlier, Dennis, our Lord is the one that's working through her. He's the one that's arranged this and he knows what he's doing. As you mentioned earlier, this devotion to Mary is so critical. It's the school of the Holy family. I pray the Rosie because she has asked for it. And as she said in Fatima, back to the point here, six times in those apparitions, the one thing that she repeated each month was that when you pray the rosary, you can avert war and you can bring peace to the world. Look at Afghanistan. Look at Venezuela. Look at the borders. The Taliban is now armed. I mean, greater than most other militaries in this country and so forth and so forth and so forth. China, Russia, you name it. What more has to happen before we start taking those words seriously. And those of us who know about these words and her message and her urgent call, what more has to happen before we start proclaiming this more clearly and with more passion and zeal and love and patience? Yes, but, but we ourselves never miss a rosary, never miss a day, never miss this, this, the most, these, these opportunities to have devotion to Mary. When it's not about feel good, it's about salvation, conversion, as you mentioned, Dennis, conversion of souls, and also the fact that she's made abundantly clear, as she did in Akita in 1973 through Sister Agnes, and Father, you know what we're getting close to now, almost two years from the time Sister Agnes had that other message from the angel right. about pray a rosary of repentance, put on ash, and then boom, right after that, we had the Pachamama Synod, and then the Wuhan flu exploded. And everything since then has well, been... Then right after that, it was... a simultaneous yeah it was right at the same time the amazon said it started on october 6 2019 and that's when that message came october yep. 6 2019 yep. and here we are on the 450th anniversary coming up now of october 7th of battle of lepanto our lady of right. victory slash our lady of most holy rosary and so forth but i guess my question to both of you and dennis maybe you head this off uh, as our guest here is 
is this call from Our Lady, this urgent call, <clears throat> pray the rosary. She said nothing about if it feels good. She said nothing about it's going to be lofty and it's going to be wonderful. And you're going to hear Ave Maria sung by, by you know, Bocelli behind in the background. She didn't talk that way. She said, do it. And then she showed the children the vision of hell in Fatima and talked about a second world war and talked about the, the threat, the one warning that she gave us. And we all got to listen to this. The one warning that she gave for the future was the error of Russia's ways. Communism is rampant. It's crept into America. It's not just around. It's here. We're dealing with socialism, Marxism, whatever you want to call how it's unfolding. But Dennis, can you speak to the seriousness of her message, especially in Fatima and the last hundred years? Every time she has appeared in these church-approved apparitions, she emphasizes the need for conversion, rosary, and then you get weeping statues and weeping images as if what more does heaven have to do to make it abundantly clear that we are in a critical time and the message is urgent? What will it take to wake people up to say, look, I might not fully get it, but I can pick up the beads and I can start moving them through my fingers. Even if it doesn't feel amazing, it's only 15 to 20 minutes a day, for heaven's sake. I'm, I'm going on here. Dennis, please. Yeah, the, the, the point is, and I know as a previous, as I said, uh, Protestant pastor, I had an aversion to praying the rosary myself. I thought... Why don't I just go to the Bible and read? I know where all those mysteries are. I'll just read them. Then I heard Father Michael Gately on an interview say, there's something mysterious about the rosary that just, you know, grace happens. And I went, oh my gosh, there's grace attached to just being faithful and praying it. So a supernatural and, aspect. Yeah, and that's the part, you know, we always want to just, understand these things in our mind but isn't our faith sometimes just stepping out so as we stepped out my wife and i am praying the rosary we have noticed a tremendous difference well it's completely converted our lives quite frankly it's led us to a deep devotion to our lady and it's led us to a place where we know that the rosary is the compendium of the gospel i mean this is the way that the gospel was preached and this brings us to the point of the movie that we're producing called Bridge of Roses. It is the story of how the early Jesuits used the rosary to preach the gospel. Because they didn't have Bibles. It was really easy, right, to just grab the rosary and say, oh, yeah, let's teach them the creed right. and go through the creed. So the Our Father, the Hail Marys, which is the Hail Mary is scriptural. So obviously the rosy, rosary has got incredible value that's beyond what maybe our limited understanding is when we first think about the repetitive nature to it. No, it's, it's much more than that. And there's where we just have to take Our Lady seriously, where yes, the rosary is going to do incredible things in terms of winning battles, battles for hearts, battles for nations. We know that. So we need to be obedient and do that. And quite frankly, so that is what this movie is about. Out. The Bridge of Roses movie is about um, it, it's about this call to confraternity. And I can tell you, when you start hearing Father Calloway speak about the confraternity in the movie, and when you start hearing from the promoter general, and what I find interesting about Father Lawrence Liu, think about it. He's in the Dominicans. I find when he speaks, there's like this weight of 800 years of an order that comes out and you just want to go up and go out and sign up right away. Confraternity. I never heard about the confraternity. I got to enroll. I mean, I'm telling you, when you hear these wonderful clerics speak about the, the efficacy of the confraternity, that's what you want to do. So really we're inviting people to, of course, watch the movie and become movie missionaries to enroll others in the confraternity. So as we talk about the rosary and the efficacy of it, this is really why we've crafted this movie, this uh, Bridge of Roses film, because it really does a phenomenal job of promoting enrollment in the confraternity, the efficacy of the confraternity. And I am really excited that we've got a great sneak peek for you to see tonight. So here, here we go. The Holy Rosary and the Confraternity is part of Mary's plan, her blueprint, if you want to call it that, for the salvation of the world. Salvation comes to us from Christ 
through Mary, and all of us when we pick up our rosaries as members of the confraternity and we pray our rosaries together, we increase in charity for God and for one another, and the, char the rosary itself becomes an act of great mercy. Mary as Queen of Intercessors, you know, invites us to share with her role as an intercessor because she is the great intercessor, you know, before the throne of God. Um, and she wants us to be united to her intercession and to join our intercession with hers. That's what, that's what really helps the power of the prayer have the kind of effect that, that it can have when we join with her, when we recognize that she really is interceding before the throne of her son on our behalf. And this becomes a communal, a worldwide thing when everyone, you know, Catholics throughout the world, all embrace this same practice. And it's kind of like we're all in the same school. We're in the school of our Blessed Mother, and she is teaching all of us about her son Jesus, just like she would have shared with John, the beloved disciple, about Jesus, what she knew about her son, insights she would have had. I mean, she spent you know, over 30 years with, with her, her son Jesus. I'm a parish priest in Northwest London, in an area which has become gradually less and less Catholic, and in a church that is absolutely enormous. It's one of the fifth largest churches in London. And so this idea that reviving the confraternity and reviving devotion to Mary is going to bring people back to God is absolutely beautiful for me. And I think we all know that right now in the world, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of fear, anxiety. Um, people are suffering. And yet God is still with us. And isn't that what Our Lady always wants to reassure us of? That we've not been abandoned. We have a loving Father, a good God good father who wants to comfort us in these difficult times. And that's exactly the sort of blueprint that I have for this parish, for this shrine, and indeed for the church in England as well, which is to encourage us to pray the rosary, to build up the confraternity here in the rosary shrine in London as well. Oh, Dennis, awesome uh, movie clip there, the little trailer. Um, I know that we've been meeting every Thursday night in my parish since May 13th. And, you know, we came out of the the, uh, the pandemic and the quarantine and, and, you know, not going to church for a while and all this stuff. I just felt it was important for us to get locked in with our Lord. We pray the rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament, um, and other, other special prayers. And then we have this beautiful social afterwards again, to help build our family back up again. Uh, and we were going to actually end by going up to the Capitol. We're not, because you know what we want to do? We want to have a movie night with this movie instead. 
I, I can't wait for this. And we're going to get popcorn and all that stuff. But you are launching this on October 7th. And uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's it's kind of the way to launch the whole confraternity con thing, right? So everybody should get this movie and 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 watch it together, and let's get this whole movement of confraternity going. But the movie is really uh, meant to really facilitate that in a big way, right? Yeah, even more than that, it's going to be neat because we're going to have you and hopefully Doug on with us on Zoom. We'll do a pre-launch of the movie. We're going to be up at Cap de la Madeleine, which is where the movie was filmed, good chunks of the dramatic uh, re recreations. And we're going to do a countdown and we're going to have oh, nice. everybody stream it right at the same time. Oh, and nice. Then we'll yeah, yeah, and then we're cool. all going to come together afterwards and go, all right, let's go and roll and let's get more people yeah, rolling and it. launch the confraternity. Because I really believe That's the all United October 7th, right? October 7th, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I really Well, I really believe the U.S. and the shrines in the U.S. are going to be a great catalyst for other shrines around the world. So it, it's so going to be awesome. Right around 7 p.m. Central time, because I know yep. we talked about our holy hour 6 to 7, and then we yep. would do it right, at, right after benediction, we'd do this launch. That's what we're going to do. Uh, so, so we'll be linked in from the Cape and where you are, Pine Bluff. I'm hoping, Doug, you can chime in. You'll, you'll be awesome if we can all be together yeah. and yeah. launch this anniversary. film and launch this call to confraternity. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. St. Pius V, pray for us, right? Amen. Yeah. All right, you guys, I got to go to my fa my family fantasy football league draft. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, all yeah. right. Thank so you, Father. the prayer. In the name okay. of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. We ask for a special outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, upon this whole movement to get everybody enrolled in the confraternity of the Most Holy Rosary. Uh, and we ask special prayers of Our Lady and uh, Pope St. Pius V. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, Dennis.